Welcome to the Pisces Solar Festival webinar of the 2025 initiative. Today we invite you together to reflect on the state of the world affairs with our special guest today, Mince Vanderveld from Switzerland. Hello, Mince. Hello, there I am. I hope Thank you can you. hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you well. Thank you very much for agreeing to share with us today your thoughts and your vision and leading us in the meditation in this day of full moon. So, thank you. The floor is yours. And uh, I will make you a presenter that you could share your screen. Yes. You do see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much um, for the invitation and uh, first of all greetings from Geneva where I am today. It's a great pleasure to share some thoughts with all of you on a subject of quite some interest in the world of today. The State of World Affairs as is the title of this talk. The idea of talking about such a vast topic came from a talk I gave last year at the Arcane School Conference in New York with the title The Science of Social Evolution, The Path to World Unity. Since then, at least in appearance, the world scene has changed quite a bit but when we talk about the science of social evolution, what do we mean by that? To get an idea, let us look at what the Tibetan tells us. He says, in the future, the science of the Antakarana and its lower correspondence, the science of social evolution, which is the joint or united Antakarana of humanity as a whole, will be known as the science of invocation and evocation. It is in reality the science of magnetic rapport in which right relationship is brought about by mutual invocation producing a responsive process which is one of evocation. This comes from the Raisin Initiation, page 470. And he goes on. It is this science which lies behind the rapport between man and man, group and group, and eventually between nation and nation. It is this invocation and the consequent evocation which eventually relate soul and personality and soul and monad. It is the outstanding objective of humanity's appeal to God, the hierarchy, and the spiritual powers of the cosmos, no matter by what name you call them. <coughs> Sorry, I have a slightly cold, but I try to, to keep track. The appeal goes forth, the invocation of humanity can and will and must evoke response from the spiritual hierarchy and give the first demonstration upon a large scale of this new esoteric science esoteric because it is based upon sound. Please keep in mind this idea of an invocative call of humanity. It will play an essential role throughout the whole talk. Of course, such a call may be... <laughs> sorry. Such a course <coughs> may be viewed from the angle of the inner planes, but I hope to touch upon some signals thereof on the outer planes too. Focusing on world unity, we can read in the book Esoteric Psychology, this will be released in fuller measure during the Aquarian Age, through the agency of the seventh ray. One of its earliest effects will be the increase of the understanding of brotherhood and its real scientific basis. 
Normally, I conclude my presentations on the electric universe with this quote. Some of you know that this is one of my favorite subjects, electricity. But don't worry, today I'm not going to talk about the universe and its cosmology. What I want to emphasize is the understanding of brotherhood and the scientific basis thereof. When talking about world unity, how far are we in understanding brotherhood? And not only understanding it, but bringing it into practice in our daily life on the physical, emotional and mental planes, individually and also as humanity. The quote is talking about the Aquarian Age, which will last at least over 2000 years, and depending on what time scale you like to use, has just started or is about to start, the Aquarian Age I mean. So, to see the qualities and characteristics of, the, of this age really in full swing would, to my mind, take at least a quarter of this period, about 500 years. It will thus be no surprise that in the world of today, we hardly see these main qualities and characteristics in our daily life. Yet, it is good and important to keep these in mind as something we, as humanity, but also each of us as an individual as indi individually has to work to, despite the outer circumstances. Keep it as a goal. We may have the most esoteric ideas about the unity of mankind, about brotherhood and sharing, but I always very much appreciated Tibetan's comments when he states that these exquisite theories are of very little use or value and impact if they are not paralleled by practical application in the three worlds of manifestation. So, don't expect me to say, oh well, everything is going fine, we are almost there. I will also touch upon some things where humanity, that world disciple preparing for the first initiation, is doing not so well. <coughs> Sorry. I would like to pick up on the end of my New York talk, where I referred to the hints that Tibetan has given us with respect to human planning. Hint 2 reads, human planning today is one of the first indications of the emergence of the will aspect. The full reading of that hint is as follows. When the stream of direction is noted by the one who seeks the inner sight, then let the master indicate the pattern and then await results. This may take time. Results come not through the action of but one. They appear when the many respond on earth to that which comes from the higher center through the one. This they do blindly when it states the first. Later, they move with care and right direction. Thus, affairs are changed on earth. So, ideas may be presented by one person, but to get significant change, the many, the masses, need to be reached. We often read that we live in a period of transition in texts written several decades or even a century ago. I'm thinking of HPB and other theosophical writers here. Yet, the time we are now witnessing, and the decade in front of us, seems to me really a period of great transition. <clears throat> Let me first join in some of the more recent outer phenomena, as these can simply not be ignored, without wanting to dominate the theme of this, introductory, of this introduction to our Pisces Full Moon Meditation. I do not belong to the group of people believing that the recent election of President Trump in the US is a so-called gift of the hierarchy to accelerate the working out of the plan, or anything coming close to that. Neither do I appreciate the rise of populism all over the world at this time. Populism has always been with us but it has normally been contained to reasonable and small limits of voter numbers. One exception 
was the beginning of the first part of the 20th century when Nazi populism dominated Germany with results we all know about. One of the good things of being in Geneva, with its motto, I seek to fuse, to blend and serve, is that you can really see that working out here in the city. Geneva is a unique place where despite all the backslash oppositions and problems, real efforts are made to establish peace and to promote universal human rights. <clears throat> Last week I attended a lecture at the Graduate Institute here in Geneva in a building called Maison de la Paix, which means the House of Peace, a very symbolic name. The lecture was by Stephen Holmes and the title was How Democracies Die. One of the things he remarked was that over the time of several generations we seem to forget the way we talk about separatism, religion and patriotism would be simply impossible in the decade just after the horrors of the World War. Yet, the younger generations of today have not known that World War and thus look at these themes in another way. You might consult the website of the Graduate Institute where most of the public talks are available for online streaming and there are some very interesting ones. Nowadays, don't forget that we are more and more interconnected through the Internet. Populism pops up worldwide under different guises. France, a country where I lived for 30 years, has known it, known it already for decades. <coughs> and other countries of Europe have more and more to cope with it. And of course, last but not least, the US in recent years. It may seem significant, but to my mind it is worrying nevertheless. The level of debate nowadays is in free fall. Was it usual in Parliament to address one another through the chairman? Nowadays, representatives attack each other directly and often personally even using Twitter or other public social media. The discussions are not anymore about ideas. Even the word rhetoric is about to change. Was it at first meant to describe the art of convincing people of an idea and the discipline taught at universities? Nowadays it is used to describe a bunch of lies thrown out in the press and social media. The Oxford Dictionary declared the word post-truth as its word of the year 2016. Post-truth is described as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Remember in this case the, the story of the cave of Plato. People were chained in a cave so that they could only see a wall on which shadows were cast. For them, these two-dimensional shadows, in illusion, were the real world. They had no other reference than these illusions. The difference between a lie and post-truth is not that big, is it? But let's not fool ourselves. I prefer to continue to call a lie a lie, whatever other words we may invent for that. As to the recent elections in the U.S., an interesting passage can be found in the recent initiations, page 746, which reads, True democracy as yet, is as yet unknown. It awaits the time when an educated and enlightened public opinion will bring it to power. Towards that spiritual event, mankind is hastening. The battle of democracy will be fought out in the United States. There, the people at present found, vote and organize their government on a personality basis and not from any spiritual or intelligent conviction. There is a material, selfish aspect to democracy, rampant today, and there is a spiritual aspect, little sought after. 
This was published in 1960. Is it that long ago? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> We know from the Bailey teachings that humanity is still, for its major part, focused in Atlantean consciousness. That's a nice and perhaps slightly abstract way of saying things, but does that work? But does that work? How does that work out in practice? To quote Professor Holmes again, when things go less well, people tend to vote guided by their emotions rather than by their minds. Isn't this what we clearly see in front of us? Right human relations is not simply goodwill, as some people seem to think. It is a product or result of goodwill and the instigator of constructive changes between individuals, communities and nations. We are told in the externalization of the hierarchy that the objectives of the hierarchy are, first of all, to bring about those conditions which will make the coming of the Christ possible. The blended influence of incoming energies for which the Christ is responsible will bring about what may at first appear to be undesirable results, because the remaining opposition of the forces of evil is still active and must be overcome. This may necessitate drastic measures, but great good will eventually appear. This is something probably to keep in mind too. And secondly, to prepare the minds of men so that they may be ready for the influence of the avatar of synthesis, of which his influence will be spread through the work and the activity of the Christ. This is something perhaps even further in the future, but nevertheless also important to keep in mind. Synthesis is an aspect of the first divine characteristic, the will, or rather, the will to good. This energy or influence produces cohesion, a drawing together, and a tendency to fusion and union. The endless selfish propaganda of the past, in speech or in writing, most of it materialistic, nationalistic, and basically untrue and wrongly motivated, became such a clamor that it reached to the spheres usually impervious to the sounds of Earth. The avatar of synthesis was called in to aid. The main objective and the immediate task of the Christ is to bring to an end the separateness which exists between man and man, family and family, community and community, and nation and nation. This is a simple statement and one that can be understood easily by the most ignorant. It is nevertheless a task which has required the mobilizing of the entire planetary hierarchy and the assistance also of a great being who would normally work on levels of consciousness higher than those on which the Christ and his disciples labor. And the third objective of the hierarchy is to stimulate the aspirant aspiration of the hearts of men, so that human receptivity to the good, the beautiful and the true may be greatly increased. These energies will bring in the new creative era, which will sweep into expression as soon as world tension has subsided. Then men will be free to think and to create the new forms for the new ideals. Then they will bring into manifestation in words, in color, in music, and in sculptured forms, the new revelation and the new world which the coming of the Christ will inaugurate. Let us come back to the theme of the Antakarana and of humanity as a whole, and about the signs of invocation and evocation. Please keep in mind that invocation of humanity can and will and must evoke response from the spiritual hierarchy. Perhaps it's good to remember too that we are basically talking about the creation and empowering of thought forms. To bring this somewhat closer to our own life, to the world of today, let us zoom in on one specific topic, refugees or migrants. 
Refugees have been with humanity almost from the beginning of time. Just recall Moses leading his people out of Egypt quite a while ago. <clears throat> Today we live in a globalized world. Do we react differently? More as a brotherhood? It is estimated that the Syrian Middle East conflict generates roughly a million of refugees. But <clears throat> Here you have a quote of what Angela Merkel had to, to say about that. <coughs> I'm sorry. To put this into a broader perspective, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimated that in 1951 about 2.1 million migrants globally uh, existed. 2.1, maybe you cannot really see this on this slide, but 2.1 million is on the left at the bottom of that graph. And in 2014, this figure has exploded to 52.9 million. We know that eons ago, things did not really go as planned. That's why the fourth tense of the Great Invocation has and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Whereas the last phrase is let the plan of love, the, sorry, let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. How do we know that as humanity we are really making progress? The world war came to an end and initiatives were taken to seal that door where evil dwells. One of these, the four freedoms, were established in 1941. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. As formulated by that great disciple Theodore Roosevelt. Another, another, another are the formation of the United Nations in 1945. When reading the Charter of the United Nations, it is interesting to note that the fourth purpose of the UN reads to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. That means the UN are not the final answer to all world problems. They are a mechanism, a process for harmonizing the actions of nations. The six ray <laughs> sorry. The sixth ray is withdrawing and the seventh ray is coming in. This brings all the conditions together for plenty of change, turmoil, but also revelations. It's also generally accepted that the age of Aquarius will, will be one of revelations where everything will come to the surface. Everything will be seen and nothing remains hidden. Perhaps WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden and recently the Panama Papers are foreigners thereof. Before a new world can be built, the old world has to be purified. The Tibetan reminds us the changes brought about by the hierarchy have been the result of the work of the disciples of the world. Forever the occult law holds good as above, so below, which means that it is a two-way process and the reorganization of planetary affairs which is taking place at this time is partially the effect of the changes produced in the hierarchy by first the higher and more intelligent type of disciples who are now affiliating with the ashram of the in instinctive demand for group work and recognition and secondly, the new energies pouring through Shambhala into the hierarchy. These are of an extraplanetary nature and they have their source largely in the Aquarian quality of the present cycle, steadily eliminating the energy of the Piscean age. Peter Python reminds us too of the importance of the educating of humanity in the distinction between spirituality and materialism, pointing to the differing goals of the combatant forces, sharing and greed, 
outlining a future world wherein the four freedoms will be dominant and all will have that which is needed for right living processes and light and dark demonstrating difference between an illumined future of liberty and opportunity and the dark future of slavery. These points look like the ABC of any normal and decent and civilized education. The United Nations here in Geneva continue to stress the educative responsibility of the media in the broadest sense of that word which seems nowadays to be more and more lacking, focusing primarily on commercially interesting information without taking into account the consequences thereof. But are we doing <coughs> really well if you look, for example, at the financial aspect of the One Humanity? Do we share the resources and wealth of the planet? In a recent Oxfam, Oxfam study, and this was of January 2016, we read the richest 62 people in the world own the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world population. That was a report broken at the top from 2016. That was a year ago. In January 2017, the conclusion was that now only the six richest men in the world own the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. This is a trend to worry about, as extreme inequality may be a threat to world stability. In Discipleship of the New Age, the Tibetan refers to this most difficult issue of money in a way which merits to be quoted completely. <clears throat> the key to the right expenditure of money and to its correct use can be summed up in the following statements to which I would ask all of you to pay attention. As money has in the past ministered to personal and family need, so in the future it must minister to group and world need. Each unit has in the past attempted to act as a magnet and to attract to itself that which will meet what, is regard, what it regards as it need, using personal activity and labor if of no influence or education and financial manipulation where that was possible. Groups in the future must act as magnets. They must see to it that they are animated by a spirit of love. I give you a thought here which is capable of much expansion. <clears throat> Need, love and magnetic power are the three things which consciously or unconsciously attract money. But they must all manifest at once. The need in the past has not always been real, though it has been felt. Such is the world glamour and delusion. The love has been selfish and unreal. The demand for things material has been for that which is not necessary to health or happiness. The magnetic force utilized has been, therefore, wrongly motivated and this process, carried forward over so long a time, has led to the present dire financial situation in the world. The economic ills of mankind closely responds to disease in the individual body. In both there is a lack of free flow of the necess necessities of lives of life, sorry, to the point of distribution. The direction of the distribution is faulty and only through a sane and worldwide grasp of the New Age principle of sharing will, you, will human ills be cured. This is a fundamental, if not the fundamental, principle of all spiritual progress. In the last analysis, also this presupposes an eventual and scientific recognition of the etheric body of the planet and consequently of man. There are signals of immense progress too. In the last two decades, under the direction of the United Nations, <coughs> sorry, global projects have been initiated with results never seen before. First of all, we had the Millennium Goals, of which you see here a slide, 
and which we can see here what is achieved. The Millennium, Co Millennium Goals consisted of eight goals to be reached. Of course, not all were reached, yet enormous progress has been made. Please note here the care for birth and health. This is more significant than at first thought of. Overpopulation of the Earth is a problem mentioned by Alice Bailey too. However, due to improved living circumstances, Demographists like the Swedish Dr. Hans Rosling, who unfortunately passed away a few weeks ago, come to the following picture indicating a world population stabilizing at approximately 10 billion in 2100. A result obtained by better health, care and above all education. We are now focusing on 2030 with the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, of which there are 17. Why is sustainability such a key word? This is the first time in the history of mankind that governments, businesses and non-governmental organizations work together on projects of global scope and importance. One of these, Goal 13 on Climate Action, has made a tremendous and unexpected breakthrough with the Paris COP21 agreement. Here too, not only governments but also civil society through its NGOs have actively contributed to the form formulation of the agreement. The Geneva Center of the Lucis Trust organized a very successful World Goodwill Seminar last year on the ethical responsibilities of the SDEs uh, at the United Nations office in Geneva. Most probably we will continue this trend this year too by organizing again the World World Weir Seminar at the United Nations. We will see and I will tell you more about it later on. I already mentioned the incoming seventh ray and started with perhaps one of its earliest effects will be the increase of the understanding of brotherhood and its really scientific basis. It is my hope that we do not have to wait till that seventh ray comes to full power before the brotherhood of man will be an established and globally recognized fact. Thank you. Thank you, Mintz for sharing with us your thoughts and uh, inspiring further reflection on this very complex topic. And I invite now our audience to share your thoughts, uh, comments and maybe questions that we could together continue this reflection. And to do so you can uh, use the function raise your hand on your control panel. Um, thus we will know that you would like to share something and we will unmute you. Also you could um, share your comments in the question section of your control panel. I think it's a good thing for us to have maybe a moment of silence to reflect and gather our thoughts.
Mintz, I would like to ask you how you see this in this period of time that we live in this choice that we have that in that one of the quotes that you shared with us that's it's either freedom or sla slavery light or darkness what beacon we can have as this servers of the disciples and uh, how we can navigate in this stormy sea of events of today keeping our in integrity of our action I think it's a question that all of us it's been reflecting this last year or even years and uh, I think it's a task that all of us has it strongly ahead of us yes I think it's a very good question and I've been thinking of it too um, for those of you who don't know me I'm um, I was a student in the 60s, in the 68, and I've known that period even though I wasn't really very active in it, I was still very moved by it. And that was a period where change was around. It didn't give the results everybody expected. But at least some things have changed. Uh, there is a more liberty of expression, there were things going on, and now we live in another period <coughs> where, again, big change is, is going on. But to my mind, there, we do have a tendency to project our state of mind upon the people around us, upon humanity. By that I mean I was completely flabbergasted and disappointed by the results of the US election which to me were completely unimaginable nevertheless they are a reality of life and what I learned from that is that in a sense we are maybe too optimistic by projecting our state of mind and I suppose we are all working towards cooperation sharing and things like that love compassion but that is not the case of big parts of humanity and I think we should on the one hand face this, see this as a fact and on the other hand not be disappointed because some facts are positive, some facts are negative but we are supposed to be may I say detached, I'm not, but at least we should try to be detached of all these effects, of all these consequences, because they are actually only consequences of inner, inner sources and inner energy. So, I would say everybody who is working for, whatever you want to call it, the reappearance of the Christ, the hierarchy, or even just trying to be a good person, I think we should not be blinded by the things we see. They are not good. They are, there are risks in it. Um, just to come back to this, this lecture which I attended of Professor Holmes, he said sometimes small things can have big effects. That can be in a positive sense, but it can be in a negative sense too. And we are witnessing now, call it the backslash or difficult times, but we shouldn't be discouraged, actually we should be encouraged to continue and to do our work by working for the forces of light. I think I actually um, in that 
uh, camp of optimists that you mentioned and that I see the hope in the results of the recent election in the US that it's a big uh, opportunity for people to waken up and it's a big opportunity to actually to expose the, the system with the, it, all its flaws. Of course it's uh, there is big risks associated with these opportunities. Probably this is something that we all needed because uh, you know we can either like if anyone like any individual and probably humanity in general can either learn through education and awareness and through um, kind of understanding or we can learn through experience and it's uh, learning through the experience always been more effective for uh, people who are not completely mentally polarized and so that's the reality for the, the most of humanity as you say and so probably going through these circles of crisis is the way for uh, for humanity to learn and make that steps forward at least I <coughs> see it this way I, I choose to see it that way and uh, it's it's opportunity, not necessarily that we will take that opportunity, but there is hope in that. Yes, I agree. There's also a completely different wave going on, which I didn't mention. Um, first of all, just to come slightly back to the 60s, that was a wave, but it was not very well organized. Nevertheless, it, it brought some kind of positive energy to this world. Nowadays, there are a lot of projects which you don't hear very much about, which, which are still going on. They are going on mostly on local scales. People are organizing themselves to do permaculture, uh, uh, raising vegetables. Um, I can give you one example, and you have to look it up on Google. It is, there is a, a, a film which is called Tomorrow, or in French it is called Demain, D-M-A-I-N, but it is in English too, which summarizes all kinds of local activities worldwide. It's not only a French film, they went to Detroit, they went to Finland, they went to Findhorn and whatever. So there are a lot of local projects which are actually in a, in a quite... Um, productive uh, state which you don't hear anything about in the in the so-called uh, major media nevertheless these are people and there could be you and me we could participate in these and this is a, a movement which is much better organized than what than uh, we were in the 60s so there is there is reason for hope you already mentioned um, well, you are probably more in the States, and if, whether you want it or not, but everybody, really everybody, is, about, is talking about Trump. That's exactly what he wants, but at the same time, it also helps people who would never worry about politics or things like that. They are now forced to take a position, to think about it, and that are there I agree, um, this is really a positive uh, a positive phenomenon. But try to have a look at this film tomorrow because it gives you a window to, uh, to things which, which are going on in this world too. Um, thank you. We'll try now to check the link and maybe we'll share it right away on the ch chat. Um, I will unmute Christine. Uh, Christine, you are muted on your end, so please unmute yourself. Hello. Yes. Okay. Hello. I, I, I really love the topic. It's so pertinent. Um, before I get to my question, I do want to say that we are definitely at a choice point. And Mr. Trump is just 
doing his part. And I don't feel hopeless at all because I do know that the alternative would have been worse. And the only thing I want to drop on that note is that if you choose, you can go to the YouTubes and find out the history of the Jesuits. Now, my question is the fact that now you have given us a way to see the Antakarana in our daily lives. But you made a comment, Mintz, that it was based on sound. And I would like that clarification. That's a big, <laughs> that's a really big question. <laughs> I, I have been thinking of leaving that phrase out of the quote. <laughs> um, that would lead to to something which I'm not capable of um, explaining now. Um, sound is something very deep. Uh, it's, it, is a, it is an energy which is closely related, if you want, to electricity. But then you would need to see um, all energetic phenomena um, on different scales of frequency. Mm -hmm. And sound is an electric energy in a certain range of frequency, but far beyond what we perceive of sound. I mean, we all know about music, uh, about talk, which is in a certain range of frequency. But we can push sound much, much further in frequencies, and then we come into realms, uh, we go to the etheric planes, and uh, we would have to talk about all those kind of phenomena, I think that would be a bit beyond the scope of this seminar or of this talk. But it is okay. it's a very good question and I appreciate asking it, but I apologize that it would stretch a bit <laughs> the scope of this, this talk. Well, I have an understanding as an energy healer and okay. I have, I am anticipating going to a uh, gong healing session next week on the equinox and um, you know we have the music of the spheres uh, mm -hmm. in in the concept of you know esoteric uh, in that esoteric realm so exactly what you're saying to me this is beyond our human ear I think that's what you're saying absolutely uh, yes and and yet it's there it works um, the um, Solvegio scale is the one that was intended, but the churches took it away from us. Uh, so that is what I use for healing of the chakras. And uh, I, I agree with you that as we go into the new age, which I have just recently been told is only 100 years from now, the beginning of the Aquarian age, um, that the fourth ray itself will be uh, in process. You mentioned the second ray, which I thought was still here, but beauty and art and all of this, that's the fourth ray. So that's where we're going. We can heal with color now, as I do, the Dinshaw method, and uh, all of this is, it's here, but only in a small minority of people, as I am a member of the Theosophical Society, which gives me that foothold, and that's where I'm jumping off from. So thank you for presenting the idea of how we can reach out in brotherhood, because that is, again, one of our principles. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment and your question. There is another raised hand. Uh, I will unmute Michael. Uh, Michael, please unmute yourself on your end. Yes, hello. Is my voice available to you now? Yes. Very good. Something I find very useful at times of discouragement when world events don't seem to be 
unfolding as we might hope they would be. I find it's helpful to remember we don't have a full understanding of how the plan will unfold, but we do have a full understanding of our own experience with our path. I like to think of that as something of a path of synchronicities. As we look back on our life, we can see the moments that we have had synchronizing things that have got us to where we are today, where we've stepped on these stones, which we can really say are actually fingerprints of, of the God force. And that as we move forward into this time, we can think of those stones, that synchronicity, as a path of truth that we know this will unfold. We just maybe don't know all the details. That, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, yes, thank you very much. I think it's an interesting point you make. Uh, indeed, we do not understand all of the plan. Um, we do, as you indicate, uh, probably understand a bit of our own path. Uh, I would just like to add to that a thought of which I, um, I, I won't elaborate it, but we can also think of the experience of humanity. And we can look at the path humanity has gone and probably the cyclic ways, we can find a cyclic pattern in the path of humanity. Uh, there is a comment uh, from Maria Cristina. Maria Cristina. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'd like to just uh, to share a thought that I, I use when I look at the world affairs is that, uh, as you mentioned, means about uh, the um, Atlantean consciousness of humanity. Mm. It means emotion or water. So when we look through water, we see image reversed. So we don't see the real image. So and what helped me to to understand what's going on is uh, I don't know how to say in English, but it's a phrase from physics. <laughs> The reaction to light is darkness. So it's something like uh, every action produces a reaction. So we are told that the work of the Christ is arousing opposition. So as much opposition as we see, it means success instead of uh, failure of humanity. And uh, the moment we reverse the situation and we go to the, I, I used to say, we, we need to go to the manuals, to the teachings. And uh, in the white magic, we, we read that the approaching of the Christ, uh, the result can be a wave of crimes. So we have this mystic vision or uh, expectancy before the cleansing uh, we cannot see the, the true vision or we cannot see the materialization of the, the kingdom. The moment now is to take the hydra from the caves and we are seeing what was hidden so we can deal with it. At the ending of cycles, all the garbage have to come out to be transmuted. But this is the work of the cycles. Uh, the most of people who are, uh, we are also <laughs> emotionally polarized, need you to go to the desert and from there to deal with the situation. And uh, in the teaching, he said uh, there are a great need of disciples that can absorb, raise, and transform what comes out. So I, I have a, a really positive vision of the plan at the moment. 
we, we need just to reverse what we are seeing and see that the light is winning the day. And uh, any uh, thought, on the contrary, just feed uh, the obstructions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Christina, for this comment. Um, <clears throat> if you have the impression that I have not a positive or optimistic view on the plan, I must contradict you because <laughs> me too, I have a very positive and constructive view of the plan. There's one thing I want, <laughs> I want to add to you because you give me a beautiful opportunity. Um, you mentioned that disciples needed to go to the desert. Um, I think we live in a time where disciples now have to engage in a group activity and this is more needed than ever. But that's the only comment I want to make. Thank you very, very much for your sharing your thoughts. Uh, Mintz, Mintz I, I know you, I see you see things right. I would just uh, add in to your positivity. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. You. I hope to see you next at the conferences. With pleasure, with pleasure. I look forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, there is another raised hand. Uh, uh, Rebecca. Uh, hello. Good morning, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, you're unmuted, so if you have anything to share, please. <laughs> So I will uh, leave you unmuted so you could um, step in when you will sort out your technical things. There is a comment from uh, Leslie. I will read. Sharing more ideas about sound from Letters on Occult Meditation, page 336. Uh, I think I will just copy paste it into the chat window that everyone could follow me on this sharing. Just a second. Okay, so here it is. So now you can read the quote in the chat window uh, following uh, my reading. So, the stimulation of music. Certain sounds shatter and break. Certain other sounds stimulate and attract. When the key of a man's life is known, when the sound he responds to is recognized, then comes the possibility of the utilization of sound in refinement. All that is at present possible to those of you who seek to serve is to attend to the above essentials and to seek contact with high vibration. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing. Yes, very beautiful. We have a um, mm, couple minutes l left for our sharing session before we go into meditation. So, if anyone has any uh, follow-up thoughts uh, or comments, or maybe it means you would like to share something before we go to meditation, please. Um, not really. I thank you all for your comments, which are really very helpful and very constructive. I just want to add so one comment is following this quote that Leslie shared with us that's keeping the uh, focus on the high vibrations and keeping our uh, stability in that alignment. It's one of the major tasks that I see for all of us, for mm -hmm. all who is capable of doing that in this time of turmoil. It's very important 
task for us to, to keep fulfilling. And one last comment, it uh, comes from Rebecca. Uh, she wrote, instead of speaking, she wrote, uh, sorry, something is wrong with, uh, uh, with the mic. Uh, thank you so much, means for your clear and stimulating talk and persevering uh, with your cough. Hope it gets better soon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your good thoughts. Uh, I was wondering if there are uh, any examples with the UN where the sustainability targets get linked in with the activities of a community level that you were talking about. Thanks again. Uh, this is coming from Rebecca from Australia. Oh, um, just a very short answer to that. There are uh, plenty of initiatives, especially here in Geneva. I don't know for New York. But in Geneva, there is um, a project launched by the Director General Michael Muller, who is really an excellent uh, personality. And they launched a what they called an SDG a hub, where local people, NGOs, civil society, government people uh, uh, come together to share all kinds of resources, information, and projects related to the SDGs. So this is only one example, but it has a, a huge potential uh, because it, it promotes commu uh, communication not only on the government level, but also people like you and me, NGOs, people who have a project. Uh, they can, it is really, uh, this is not only double talk, this is really um, a positive project to try to um, uh, move on with these SDGs because time is, is really pressing and we all know it so we are all in the same boat and there isn't really a plan B for planet Earth. There is one more hand, raised hand, so before we go to meditation. Okay. I will just want to bring more people for the share. Hello, Sharon. Yeah, hi, um, Alexander. And hello, Mintz. I, I enjoyed uh, your talk, and I, like Rebecca, would... Um, um, I want to send some energy to attend to your cough and your good health. Thank you. Um, a couple of things um, that I just wanted to share is is um, I found it comforting um, that you describe the UN as a mechanism or a process and so when we ponder the state of world affairs how comforting it is to know that the United Nations exists in and of itself you know and, and it's kind of, I explain it to my kids as kind of like being at a kitchen table and uh, for the world uh, to uh, join in this uh, discourse. Uh, and what I see happening now in, as in terms of the state of world affairs is that, that people in uh, local communities are being called to the table as well. So there's this there's this uh, outward movement where we're, we're all being invited um, to identify ourselves as, as members of, of these United Nations. It's very beautiful. I'm, I'm also uh, thinking that, that um, how Dag Hammarskjöld said that the United Nations, and I'm paraphrasing, unfortunately, I don't have the quote at hand, but said that the United Nations was formed uh, not to bring heaven to earth, but to save us all from hell. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> thank you. I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much, Aaron. Much appreciated. I really appreciate that comment, and I think it's very important note for us to all to have uh, that it's the the world affairs and the situation in the world is not 
the responsibility of the governments anymore. It's in the hands of disciples and in the hands of all people of goodwill. And it's our responsibility to reimagine this platform which was called the United Nations, this table where we all call to be gathered and to solve, try to solve our problems. So it's, I think it's a big challenge for all of us to create that dialogue spaces wherever we can do that, where we can talk about the issues of the world and the global affairs, taking it from the hands of the governments and bringing the light there through whatever means we have in our hands. Thank you. means yes it's lead us in meditation okay don't blame me if I crack the ohms at the end but I will try to do my best um, Thank you. we go in meditation the full moon approach to the hierarchy I'll start with the keynote he who faces the light and stand within its radiance is blinded to the issues of the world of man. He passes on the lighted way to the great center of absorption. But he who feels the urge to pass that way, yet loves his brother on the darkened path, revolves upon the pedestal of light and turns the other way. He faces towards the dark, and then the seven points of light within himself transmit the outward streaming light, and lo, the face of those upon the darkened way receives that light. For them the way is not so dark. Behind the warriors, twixt the light and dark, blazes the light of hierarchy. Meditation, letting in the light. Group fusion. We affirm the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers, meditating between hierarchy and humanity. I am one with my group brothers, and all that I have is theirs. May the love which is in my soul pour force to them. May the strength which is in me lift and aid them. May the thoughts which my soul creates reach and encourage them. Alignment. We project a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kumara, and towards the Christ at the heart of hierarchy. Extend the line of light towards Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known.
uh, your interlude. Hold the contemplative mind open to the exoplanetary energies streaming into Shambhala and radiated through hierarchy. Using the creative imagination, endeavor to see the three planetary centers, Shambhala, hierarchy and humanity, gradually coming into alignment and the interplay. Meditation, reflect on the seed sought for Pisces, I leave the Father's home, and turning back, I save.
precipitation. Using the creative imagination, visualize the energy of light, love and the will to good pouring throughout the planet and becoming anchored on Earth in prepared physical plane centers through which the plan can manifest. Use the sixfold progression of divine love as the sequence of energy precipitation. Shambhala, hierarchy, the Christ, the new group of world servers, men and women of goodwill everywhere in the world, and physical centers of distribution. Lower interlude, refocus the consciousness as a group within the periphery of the great ashram. Together sound the affirmation, in the center of all love I stand. From that center I, the soul, will outward move. From that center I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the Divine Self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group and throughout the world. distribution. As the great invocation is sounded, visualize the outpouring of light and love and power from the spiritual hierarchy through the five planetary inlets, London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva and Tokyo, 
irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. The great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. <clears throat> Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mince. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who attended our webinar today and who listened it in the recording. We invite you to join our coming webinars and the next webinar will be next week on March 21st. We invite you to celebrate together the equinox and at this webinar the 2025 Initiative Coordination Group will share with you uh, the plans for the new year cycle for the new annual astrological annual cycle uh, the program for the new year and uh, our guests for the new year and in the same webinar 
we will continue the cycle uh, of twice a year meditations when we do the planetary healing led by Mass Bronsted from Denmark. And the next New Moon webinar will be on March 29th. It will be Aries New Moon and we will continue our work focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and in a cycle of areas we will bring our focus, the focus of our collective meditation to strengthen the thought form of the Sustainable Development Goal number nine, uh, industry innovation and infrastructure. And we invite volunteers to focalize our new webinars, sharing your thoughts on each sustainable development goal and astrological significance of every month. So please join us on March 29th as well. Thank you and let's end our work today sounding together Gayatri. Buddha who gives the sustenance to the universe, from whom all things proceed, to whom all things return. Unveil to us the face of the true spiritual sun, hidden by a disk of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Oh.